Hello and uh, good day, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Horasis Global Meeting. Uh, today, in this particular panel and session, we are touching on a topic that probably touches everyone's life. Um, if you uh, have not tuned out from the Zoom and the uh, Run the Worlds and all the web conferences that are on, and the co constant barrage of news, uh, uh, you'd probably uh, be very familiar with what's going on in this in the in the world, especially around cyber. Uh, and that is why I think when Frank proposed the the topic of a focus topic on on encouraging greater cyber security um, from a uh, personal, corporate, and national level, it, it is an important topic for us to uh, discuss. In this panel, we have uh, uh, we have several esteemed colleagues who have uh, a very diverse background to to share. Um, uh, I, I'll start with uh, just a quick intro from myself. Uh, 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 I'm Val Mukherjee. Uh, my day job is Ernst Young. I'm a managing director with PY, uh, running the critical infrastructure energy security. Um, uh, sector for for EY cyber business, uh, and I spend a lot of time with uh, with my colleagues in the industry and uh, and uh, one of the founders of uh, Cyber Future Foundation, which focuses on these conversations on the, uh, raising the conversation from the security operation centers to the board and the C suite. So I'm really glad to have uh, today with me uh, there's esteemed colleagues uh, who are going to uh, introduce uh, themselves. Uh, um, uh, but just quickly, though, uh, Julian Weitz, we have from the, uh, is the chairman of ICMCP and also a career cyber professional. Have met with him and spoken with him for several years um, at our friends um, Synet. Um, we have uh, Jim Persbeck, who's uh, the CEO, uh, president and CEO of uh, Port San Antonio, a great partner um, uh, in the in the journey of Cyber Future Foundation and a fellow Texan. And we have another fellow Texan, and in fact, a fellow DFW Metro Texan, <laughs> as uh, mm -hmm. Francis um, uh, Gobers the third. Francis joined, uh, is the autonomy lead for Bell Helic Helicopters and uh, Bell Flight. So couldn't be a more diverse uh, group, and we'll sh uh, should be joined by a couple of other colleagues as well. So uh, I'll start with you, uh, Francis, with a little bit of introduction from your side, and then uh, we'll go to you, Jim, and then Julian. And then we'll come back around for your points of view on encouraging various cybersecurity. So, Francis, uh, over to you, sir. Okay, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thanks, Val. So, uh, yeah, my name is Francis Gowers. I'm the head of autonomy for Bell Flight, a uh, company formerly known as Bell Helicopter. Uh, we've now branched out into way more different kinds of vehicles than helicopters. Back the very concept of helicopter is kind of evolving in front of us. And I've been involved in the autonomous vehicle uh, business now for for uh, almost 30 years. Uh, started off with the Air Force uh, uh, and then uh, went to NASA, worked on the International Space Station, and then got involved with the Army's future um, uh, future combat systems and designed a whole bunch of self-driving autonomous vehicles for them and now uh, head of autonomy at Bell. So, and we wanted to talk today about cybersecurity and, and honestly, it's, it's kind of in the air we breathe. It's in absolutely everything we do, um, particularly on my, my particular job. I, I describe my, my position as I live five years in the future. My job is to create you know, what the world's gonna look like five years from now. So everything that I'm working on is is out out in the future. And we're trying to visualize, you know, what the world's gonna look like in 2026, 2027. And, um, uh, you know, we certainly have, have noticed, and it, I mean, it's inescapable that the world has become more vulnerable, that there are, first of all, we're using computers for absolutely everything. We all walk around with a, computer in our pocket. Uh, we all have all of our bills paid and our um, uh, deliveries and stuff done, you know, order our food all through the phone. So um, this course becomes, this utility also exposes a vulnerability. We're more dependent on technology than ever before. Uh, we've certainly seen that in our infrastructure, in our uh, electricity and, and other uh, functions, uh, oil, uh, pipelines. So, um, 
and in my particular world of, of autonomous cars and self-driving cars and self-flying airplanes, we're very, very concerned about the vulnerabilities that we might have for hacking and for infiltration and spying and privacy. So, um, you know, our, I guess, a focus has been on creating an infrastructure or a capability that's resilient, that's capable of responding and reacting and then, I will say, not being brought down by a single attack or a single vector of vulnerability. Um, I will say the one thing that we actually spend a lot of time on uh, and a lot of effort on is our dependency on GPS. Uh, particularly in the aviation world, everything now is all run through GPS. Um, GPS is not only used for navigation, which is the part you're probably familiar with, we also use it a lot for timing. We use the, the time of day signal and the um, frequency references that the, the GPS satellites provide, which are super stable and super accurate down to five nanoseconds to, you may, you know, for example, your cell phone is quite dependent on the timing that keeps your, your signal from running into everybody else's is actually locked to the GPS uh, satellites timing standard. So uh, in, in all sorts of things in electricity and power generation and in uh, communications are all dependent on this GPS timing signal in fact, we've kind of turned the, the term we refer to GPS these days, not as GPS, but as PNT, Precision Navigation and Timing, um, uh, because we've become so dependent on it. And so our, our you know, focus has been to build resiliency into that system so that if we lose GPS, in fact, I spend way more of my time worrying about how we operate without GPS than I do with it, because with it, we know how to work. But we, we spend a... Um, uh, all of our effort into, into dealing without it. And, and we do that throughout our, our entire tech chain where we manage a control cycle and how do we, particularly how do we get information into the vehicle and out of the vehicle again and you know, where those vulnerabilities are. We're very, very interested in, particularly I've been, I'm personally quite active with the standards organizations, the ASTM, uh, SAE, IEEE, Mm -hmm. uh, and we've been working with them on the future of 5G, uh, what, um, how the, that um, build, they're building actual functions right into 5G. I don't know if you've been to any of these planning meetings, but there are uh, high speed and low latency channels specifically built into the 5G standards, specifically for control of autonomous vehicles. Um, so we're, we're quite excited about that new capability coming on, but we also realize that this also creates a new vulnerability. We can no longer rely on, we used to call this the, the security of obscurity, where we each have our own little protocols and command and control systems because we're moving to standardized controls and interoperability and uh, vehicles talking to each other. Um, that's kind of another big thing that's coming. The vehicles are not uh, we're working a great deal, I personally working a great deal on vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications between cars talking to each other, aircraft talking to each other, so that they can um, manage their own traffic themselves and reduce some of the dependency, for example, on the air traffic control system. Yep. So anyway, let me go on, uh, pass on to the next person. Sir. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, Franz. I think the great uh, uh, the the great takeaway from from this intro and the background is basically I think the resilience part of uh, mm -hmm. is extremely important and uh, the specific comment around worrying about when a particular system is not available versus when it's available and planning yeah. around it is, is is definitely the key point. So thank you for that, Jim. Sir, over to you for your uh, intro and background. Well, thanks so much, Val. I'm always uh, thrilled when you bring me on. Uh, I'm Jim Pershbach. I'm with the Port San Antonio operation. And I think Val keeps bringing me on here because I am a latecomer to cybersecurity. I'm a latecomer to all this electronic technology and really represent uh, the user side and the business side of this, trying to integrate that not so much into the technology, but into the operations. And sometimes very critical of the tech folk. I believe that the technology is fantastic, but whether or not it is really useful in the operations is something that we're excited about seeing. And the good news is uh, it looks like more and more it is becoming simple. And it also looks like we're getting a better understanding on the user side as to the value. So Val, thanks for having me back again.
Of course, sir. Uh, uh, great to have you. And I think this will continue to be uh, enriching and enlightening for all of us, uh, the various perspectives that uh, this panel and others bring around us. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, Julian, uh, I know you, you have a very rich uh, and varied experience, especially working on the, on the cybersecurity with uh, on the federal systems. Uh, but you also represent a, a very uh, significant community uh, which is vital to the expansion of cyber uh, cybersecurity, both capacity and talent, and uh, the International uh, Association for uh, Minor Minorities, ICMCP. Um, so, why don't you introduce yourself and, and a little bit of background, uh, share a little bit of your background. Sure, I'll keep it brief. Thank you, Val. So, first of all, you know, following Francis and Jim, and I'm almost like, what, what in the world am I doing here? What, what these guys are doing is it's fantastic. Uh, again, my name is Julian Wade. As Val said, I've been in the cybersecurity industry, I guess, technically since it began. So that dates myself. Uh, at one point in my career as a practitioner, but the most of it as a vendor, you know, um, selling and building technologies to help with the cyber fight. Um, but what's most important to me, as Val, uh, you know, yielded to is the International Consortium of Minority Cybersecurity Professionals, ICMCP. Our whole goal in life and our mission is to provide a platform for women and people of color to enter the, you know, the field of cybersecurity. We work a lot with college students entering the market, people changing their careers, and also with veterans uh, who are leaving the armed forces and coming into the workforce is extremely important to us, especially since I have a son We'll be going through that at some point in time in, in the future. And so the key thing for me, and uh, I always start these things the same way, is cybersecurity is fundamentally broken. Meaning when you look at what happened with Colonial Pipeline, you look at what happened with the whole Sunburst situation um, and our friends at SolarWinds, while protection technologies are extremely important and many of the concepts that we're going to talk about in this session are crucial to the things that you do in your environment. Uh, unless you're doing what Francis alluded to, where he's building out the future five years from now, and he's thinking about the security of those systems as he's thinking about building them out, which is usually an afterthought for most applications and applications vendors. Uh, protection technologies will continue to have a limited usage and going after things that they haven't seen before. And so it becomes more and more important to make that sure that you bat batten down the hatches in your environment and that you put the best protections in place up front so you can deal with the advent of the incident once it occurs in a very programmatic, systematic, and fast, rapid fashion. And, um, and I've been a serial entrepreneur trying to solve this problem now for the last 15 to 16 years. Uh, but in short, I, I want to help and, and empower others to understand how they proactively try and stand up against our adversaries. Thank you, Val. Absolutely, and thank you. What a great mission! I think all aligned here. Uh, so, uh, Davis, uh, welcome to the welcome to the panel. Uh, uh, great timing of the entry. I think you just fit right into the intros and a little bit of background. I, uh, we had a fantastic chat last time when you spoke, and I think the work you're doing is quite innovative. So, well, go ahead, please. No, thank you. And it's not a Zoom meeting uh, unless someone has trouble getting in. So I appreciate yeah. your, your patience. Um, so uh, I, I got lucky to come into cybersecurity. I was a political science major who liked to tinker, um, but it started my background on Capitol Hill and ended up uh, working for, I think, one of our, our nation's foremost sort of thought leaders on, on this effort, uh, Congressman Jim Langevin. Uh, so when I was working on his staff uh, as a young military advisor, uh, you know, he suggested that I start looking at the cyber thing around 2008. And, you know, it's not something our constituents are hugely interested in. It seems like a pet project. Um, but at the time, uh, he had been briefed on something called the Aurora tests run out at Idaho National Labs, where uh, they were able to spin up a power generator and make it fail catastrophically just using remote vulnerabilities accessed through IT systems they had set up. Um, a, a few months later, it then came out in the news, you know, end of 2009, uh, what, what had happened with the power facility in Tons, uh, and the operation that we now publicly know as, as Olympic Games. Uh, and while he never <laughs> discussed any of that with me, if he knows anything about it, uh, it certainly, uh, you know, relates to the fact that, that he saw the storm coming. And, and I think we are now all feeling that pain 
that we saw in the early days uh, of the, the threat to our critical infrastructure based on uh, their connections to digital systems and all the benefits that we enjoy because that they're networked up and the efficiencies we receive from them. The, the problem has been, uh, despite the fact that we have known about these vulnerabilities and that we have tried to work through you know, legislation, through policy, uh, there have not been the financial incentives to really take the necessary means to look at managing this risk on an effective and wide-scale basis. Um, uh, unfortunately, it, it seems like that financial incentive has now come in, in the form of ransomware, where you find seeing uh, the criminals decide to, to move from their day jobs uh, of working uh, for, for various hostile nations uh, and taking that into the hands and decide to make a, a buck for themselves uh, using criminal means. Uh, and so this has uh, precipitated out now. Uh, and we've seen criminal actors not just target, you know, what, what we'd be afraid of uh, going after banks or financial system, but really going after what you would, you know, I guess call more like Main Street type companies, manufacturers, uh, small energy facilities, uh, anybody uh, who doesn't necessarily have a sense of critical data, but who has a, a sensitive just-in-time mission. Right, who can't stand the pain of, of being disrupted for a few days. And uh, it, it's because of that and because of this new effect beyond just data, but into the physical space, that's uh, the massive threat to, to not just uh, uh, the Internet and how we operate it today to communicate, but also to our daily lives. Um, and so I'm happy to discuss uh, more of that now as my position as uh, head of an insurance company uh, called Resilience Insurance, where we work with entities to protect them from these types of threats every day. Excellent. Thank you, Davis, for the background. And I think that's uh, the, 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 ba- the background that you bring and then pretty much what we discussed coming into this panel. Uh, I think that whole diverse thinking of how can we address this collectively is going to be extremely important. Um, with that, let me let me go back to uh, Julian for a, for a minute for the to start of the next uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, idea of thought. Is, uh, I mean, if you think about the last few months, even and we don't have to go too far back, even a few days, um, cybersecurity has been at the top of the news for, for pretty, pretty, uh, you know, in a, in a very consistent cycle. And that's not impacted on not only the infra- critical infrastructure, but also it impact, it's impacting, you know, you could talk about a ferry line, talk about a meat packing industry. Uh, it has become a nuisance now. And, and I think, you know, there is, there has to be a way to, uh, for us to not only you know rely on our good good guys at the good agency to go recover the ransom where that was paid, but also to protect each organization. What are you what are you thinking? What is your thinking in terms of how can we uh, ensure that the protection of regardless of what kind of infrastructure our company it is, how can we ensure uh, an increased um, uh, protection mechanism for these uh, companies? Uh, what is your advice? <laughs> so that's so that's the magic question, right? And there's the multiple angles you can take on that valve. But I think if you're really looking at, and, and then let's talk about the, the breadth of what you just said. A major pipeline that provides gasoline to roughly over, just over half the nation is disrupted for days with ransomware. And then, you know, the largest meat packer in the country is disrupted at the same time. And if you go back to the Maslow hierarchy of needs, right? I need to be able to eat. I need to be able to get around. It, it, these nation state hackers, whether it's by coincidence or not, they're going right after the home of what we all need and live for every day. Yeah. Uh, I recently was in San Diego for a friend's birthday party and I couldn't believe, you know, in Southern California, gasoline was over $7 a gallon. Cause I, I just, I never thought I would see that in my lifetime. Yeah. So when you go after how do we protect it best, you know, cyber hygiene, uh, technical controls, policies, and procedures have been around for well over 20 years, even longer than that. The issue is what you said when you opened up with is what has been the financial ramifications for it? What have been the, 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 you know, the penalties that have been applied when you don't do this? And for the most part, because we all see this kind of randomly and we all, and the consumer hardly ever feels it directly. There hasn't been any pressure on our government or on companies individually to deal with this. It only happens on a subjective basis. And in our world, the world we live in here in the United States, usually it happens at one point in time. It's on CNN, a Bloomberg for a few weeks. It goes away and our population then forgets about it. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I, I still think 
if, if we want to do it right, right, it, it, it needs to be something that's driven by government and there need to be penalties applied. If you can't show a certain standard of protecting the environment, especially when it comes to critical infrastructure. Otherwise, oh, okay, so that, I think that, that's, that's going to be a, 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 a very uh, highly debated point right now and uh, reserve that for the next round. So, but thank you for, for uh, making the incentives clear, right? In, I mean, it's a carrot and a stick. You have to go, go to, together. Um, uh, so le let, me, let me turn to you, Francis. Uh, you know, uh, I, I think you are one of the pioneering architects of connectivity, right? Um, mm. And it comes autonomy. And that includes a lot of data. That includes a lot of connectivity, both uh, both physical as well as as well as logical and digital. Um, how how do you advise people, uh, you know, the the audience here and also the broader uh, you know community? Uh, how can they secure from within? How can they, uh, how can we inculcate the culture of security by design? Then trying to come back and uh, you know I, I think we talked about resiliency, but also has to be security by design. And I think that's something that be top of your thinking, right? Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, and yeah, the, the, the words that you'll hear us say on our planning meetings is defense in depth. We don't ever have just one. I mean, the big concern with a lot of security is that there's one master gate. And once you get through that gate, you have the keys to the kingdom. You know, you've got everything. And we build, particularly for the, the high risk operations of vehicles we have layers and layers of defenses and uh you know there there's not only the access to the network and then the access to the program and then the certificate and then the the assigned um values and then we've actually taken we're embedding we're working actually directly with microsoft on secure boot capability for our machines and for our operating systems we're actually are protecting the bios protecting the operating systems from being damaged or being having uh, malicious code inserted in them that we can detect when a malicious code has been inserted and we can react to it. And we go down to a point where we're actually going to be signing each individual application uh, and running an integrity check on the system every time it's recycled or every time we boot it. Uh, we'll go through an integrity check on the whole software package and check that everything is where it was before and all the all the bits and bytes are the same as they were before. And if there's anything that's changed, we'll, we'll abort the system and, and uh, uh, not allow it to continue. So so we're, our, our byword, as I said, is in the connectivity is defense in depth. Yep, defense in depth and from chip to cloud, right? Yes. Uh, <laughs> Excellent point. No, thank you for that. So, D Davis, let me turn to you. Uh, in terms of what you have seen as a practitioner and now applying this to the to the to, the, to kind of provide financial incentive and and support to those organizations that probably need it most, right? Where do you see uh, we can look at this from a business standpoint? How can we incentivize people to take the right protective mechanism? So, your thoughts, sir. Yeah, so, you know, Francis discussing uh, defense in depth um, and, and Julian talking about the, you know, the standards that are set. Uh, there is a, a, a world of practitioner level and engineering level thought that has been put into this. Um, a lot of work uh, was organized together under when NIST pulled together the cybersecurity framework and released it in 2013. More to grow, and I don't think we're ever going to be done with a strategy from a technical side. But uh, yep. what, what I consistently see uh, miss the mark is an effective formula for executive level attention and understanding cyber risk as part of enterprise risk that allows you to operate your business and actually make money as opposed to something that is just uh, a check the box for IT. Um, and anywhere beyond, I, I think, you know, some folks in the financial sector are starting to do this well. Some folks in the defense sector are starting to do this well. But I think threats like ransomware are really showing us that, you know, digital operations are a part of everyone's business, right? And it, one of the things that, that we have found effective as an insurance company, uh, because we are effectively placing uh, financial bets, right, on, on a company's security. Um, and the assessments based off of that are based off a lot of these engineering standards. But even more than just the technical checks that, that we do with the client, uh, is the, the understanding the relationship about is this the type of organization 
that is willing to change or, or is willing to understand the risk. Uh, and that we found is some of the biggest drivers of, of clients that, that end up having claims versus don't. And so when we get a new client as an insurance client, uh, the first thing we do is we get together uh, their chief financial officer, uh, their general counsel, uh, and their, their head of either IT security or their CIO or whomever's in the decision making point. And we exercise a live cyber attack with them, talking about what their insurance policy covers, what it doesn't. And it always drives the conversation of, you know, at what pain point would you consider having to pay a ransom? Have you guys practiced failing over? What would you say to the public? Um, and those types of discussions that, that show that these types of incidents and, and cyber risk is really a business risk. Um, uh, what we find are most effective at preparing clients so that if an incident does happen, it, it's not a crisis. Well, uh, very well said. I think, you know, that's a vital component to have in preparation for that. It's a huge risk management um, uh, component of the of the business, uh, the, the whole insurance part is, right? So, well, uh, let me let me come to you, Jim, sir. You were the CEO. You heard your technologist. Uh, you heard your finance uh, person and you heard your your cybersecurity strategist, uh, Julian, what would you, uh, what is your take on the, on the input from these uh, three experts and uh, what else do you ask uh, them to make an informed decision that probably, you, have, you know, hopefully you don't have to, but maybe prepare to make. I, I think everything I heard is, is brilliant, but, but there are a couple of challenges that I say. The first challenge, uh, and Francis mentioned it, is amongst the standardization. We've got multiple systems. We've got multiple ways to get in. And what I keep hearing from the technology folks is everybody's going to look for the weakest point to get in. I see a lot of attention being paid to really, really vital systems. I see almost no attention being paid to the areas where I see a ton of risk coming in. And having that connectivity and that real focus, I think, is very important. The second thing is related to that. I don't think we're at a point anymore where folks in the C-suite and the boards don't understand the cyber risk. I think the point is that it is consistently overcomplicated. I'm not the brightest human being on earth. There's a lot of things I've been able to understand. When I look at pitches from cybersecurity companies, when I look at reports on cybersecurity, it's almost incomprehensible. It's not in any language that I know how to read. And more than that, we've got to flow that down to a bunch of people throughout the organization at various levels of sophistication. And we need to find some way when it talks about standardization to standardize the training and the education of those systems. And part of that means making those systems, there is at least some level of user-friendly interface about it. Cybersecurity right now reminds me of trying to log on to a computer in the 1980s. You, you really have to have some level of computer understanding to operate in that world. And I remember when the Windows came out and the Mac operating system came out, it became easier for people like me to use that technology. I'd really love to see some of that going into cyber. And the last thing I'd say, and this relates to the insurance and the government side of it, thankfully our organization hasn't suffered uh, a ransomware attack, or at least one that we've we've lost yet. But I know some organizations that have, and the response is, "Well, you're going to have to pay that ransom." And at some point in time, that's what you got to do. You, you got to kind of suck it up. But what I suspect that other folks on, on the business side would like to see are two things: one, yes, let's make sure that we're doing our job in terms of security, but let's make sure that we've got an answer that's not send a bunch of Bitcoin to some guy wearing a hood somewhere in the world. And number two, from the government side, these are major acts of, of criminal uh, attacks. They're, they're potentially acts of war. And what I see is pipelines being shut down. I, I see attacks on our food industry. I see potential attacks on our energy grid, on our communications grid. I don't know that I see a whole lot of response of that the same way that you would expect a response if somebody came over with a more traditional physical attack on our nation or our nation's interest. 
And yes, uh, there's probably a lot more that business leadership needs to do. But candidly, government needs to do something as well to show that we're taking this seriously. Huge caveat, uh, lest the State Department looks at me, I'm not calling for immediate warfare, but certainly some much more visible coordinated law enforcement activities, I think, would be tremendously helpful. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. And I think that's uh, it, it's a somber reminder for all of us that, uh, you know, cyber attacks are, are not anymore that you don't see them. So they don't happen. They're right in your face. And uh, I, I think the recent uh, likening of cyber attacks to actual terrorism is not too far. It is actually probably well placed that uh, these these attacks need to be reciprocated in the same way. And uh, uh, I mean, good thing is, you know, at least we got the money up back uh, from, from the colonial ransom that was paid, but hopefully we can track them down as well. I'm sure somebody is tracking them down, uh, but hopefully we'll get to know that know about that as well. Um, so thank you for, for those wise insights, uh, Jim. Uh, the, the, the next uh, round of, uh, of uh, discussion, I think uh, you know, I, I wanted to bring about the the point of the carrot and the stick, which, which is probably where Julian, uh, your point started from the last uh, comments you made. I mean, uh, as soon as the colonial pipeline uh, incident happened, there was a again a renewed focus on um, uh, on the uh, you know securing our pipeline. Uh, we know uh, for those of us in the energy sector, there has been a a huge enforcement from the North SIP side, which has been an enforcement action. Uh, but uh, the oil and gas industry is not really um, cybersecurity regulated. There is guidance from TSNR. I think there's a huge debate now as we go forward um, as to what would be the motivation for organizations and um, and the government to work together to protect us in a, in a better way. And then the first discussion was around the technology protection probably that we all need to implement. But as Jim mentioned, this is this this is not a CISO's role. This is not a you know chief information security of, or, um, officer's role, neither is the CEO's role. Uh, uh, it, it's probably come to a point where we have to rise and get together as a nation and uh, collaboratively work with our allies to make sure um, that we have frameworks that are extensible, not just in the US domestically, but also around the world. Uh, so, Julian, you're thinking um, on uh, on what could be uh, the right amount, you know, kind of public-private partnership or collaboration that we can put in place that could serve as motivation for this, not just the ransomware attack and shutting down the colonial pipeline or, or, or any for that matter, but actual policies that might uh, help us move forward. Hang on. You're, you're on mute, uh, Julian. That's the magic word for, for any meeting. <laughs> yeah, I apologize for that. I just wanted to make sure I didn't have any noise coming in uh, while, while, we were, while the others were talking. Of course. So my point was, is for years I've tried to work on and work with people doing kind of these public-private uh, collaborations, and it never worked. And one of the reasons it's never worked is nothing bad enough has really happened, you know. Um, someone the other day equated uh, the colonial attack to 9-11. But 9-11 was tangible. You know, uh, thousands of people died in that process. It was very tangible to us. And and to Jim's point, uh, all of a sudden we felt like we had a need to respond. What most people don't know about nation state attacks is they occur all the time, right? The, the colonial has been been... Uh, theoretically mapped back to the Russians working with, with a cyber gang, uh, also the meatpacking company uh, mapped back to the Russians. And, of course, the Chinese have been very active in our infrastructure. Um, I just don't think I don't think until there's a set of laws, even a minimal set of laws governing the way we do business, that we won't see any change unless something really bad happens. Because, as I tell people all the time, before any bullet flies or any missile, missile is dropped, there's tons of volleys that have occurred in the cyber realm. And again, our population just doesn't see it happening every day. These attacks, these major attacks that we just were sponsored by nation states, it is an act of war as far as I'm concerned. And I'm certainly not advocating that we send a whole bunch of people with guns to another country because of, because of how complicated this stuff all comes together. But 
until we do something from a governmental perspective, in my in my belief, uh, unless everybody comes to the zeitgeist, you know, this, this this new euphoria of the world that we have to think like Francis and build in security from the start, we're not going to resolve this issue. If if they do it, uh, it needs to go. It needs to be the government leading it, and the government has to lead by sharing information with us rather than withholding it. Yeah, no, I think uh, I think the more we see uh, cyber attacks impacting our daily lives, the more uh, the question becomes: What are we doing to address this uh, from a national standpoint and then the and the government standpoint? It's not just going to be enforcing uh, a, a bunch of uh, you know controls. Uh, or, uh, or or security requirements in an organization, but also collectively providing that uh, the defense that uh, probably one organization or one sector uh, cannot afford to do by themselves. Uh, well, well that, Val, one last point is the key thing to remember is our 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 adversary nations are incenting their citizens to attack us, and that's the key thing to remember. China incense their citizens to attack us. Russia incense their benefits for doing it if they can come back with tangible IP, if they can come back with dollars that half the time get routed into sex trafficking and everything else, which is against the core values of our country. But we have to take it that seriously and understand it. Yeah, I, I think you, you, you nailed it, Julian. I think there are, there are some really nefarious and malicious intent underlying that that general public doesn't really see and that's connected to organized crime that's connected to you know national security in many different ways than as as obvious uh uh from the from the surface right so thank you for that mm-hmm. julian um uh, let me let me come back to you uh, uh davis uh, in terms of uh, you know preparing for this and risk managing this risk as an organization you you mentioned about doing tabletop exercises with the executives getting them prepared for this uh, how do you uh, see the organizations that you work with taking the most advantage of, of what you offer uh, from the prepare, from the preparation and risk management uh, side of it? Yeah, so the you know the risk transfer side ha- has always been tricky around cybersecurity, and and one of the opportunities we saw in the insurance market is that the insurance industry today doesn't really treat cybersecurity like any other risk. We know the engineering standards for surviving a hurricane uh, at a certain force of wind, right? You need to put nails that are six inches long in the roof to keep the roof from flying off or, you know, category three or something. We don't have, to Jim's point, uh, a full agreement, first off, on, you know, which set of cyber standards work best for what type of threat in what type of industry. Uh, We had attempted to do this um, under the the NIST framework, which was a, a piece that came out of an attempt to, to do what Julian was talking about, regulate um, cybersecurity and, and come to a set of standards for existing regulated uh, industries that was common. So that rather than everybody trying to take a, a guess, there would be a process uh, that could understand what works, uh, it, what should be implemented for what industry, and at what level that security should be required for the public safety and, and good. That didn't happen. So cybersecurity is still largely a market force Uh, which is one of the things that interested us about insurance. Because really, as an insurance provider, we see losses uh, up to the minute on, uh, well, not every minute, but we see losses, you know, uh, up to the most recent events that are taking place. And adjusting those claims, understanding what happened with the client, getting the reports back from the incident response teams, knowing where they were before the claim, too, gives us a view of what the best ROI is on a range of these different standards that are being implemented with clients. So our goal has been to then take that learning as an insurance company would uh, and normally would put that back into the underwriting. But we also take that and we put that back into our clients. So a lot of what we do with our clients is providing that best practice guidance and feedback about what has actually worked that's specific to their organization. We also end up working with a, a range of excellent partners that offer this as their business model. You know, we're a cyber insurance company, right? We, we don't have a huge team of, of incident response practitioners going out. So we end up partnering with the existing ecosystem in a way that almost acts us as a, to, you know, Jim's point earlier about having a translator uh, for the executive staff. Since we have that relationship with the CFO, the risk manager, the CEO, we can come in and say, you know, look, your, your IT guys have been discussing about deploying MFA over your VPN. That all sounds like gobbledygook, 
right? But you guys answered to it in your insurance application that you would do it. And let us explain to you that Colonial Pipeline just got hit because they had exposed passwords on the dark web and someone got in from the outside. So we as an insurance company are thinking that this is a best practice control that you guys should maybe move from 2022 to 2021. And, you know, we really seek to use that position as a trusted advisor into the business side to help highlight which parts uh, of our being done in their IT departments internally that, that should be elevated and, and prioritized. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, you cannot address everything all, all together. So you have to prioritize areas that you can focus on. And I think that's what goes back to uh, Jim's comment as to, you know, it, make an informed decision based on where it would give you the best value, but also don't forget about the weaker, uh, you know, the supply chain or weaker areas of, of, um, of operation. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Davis. Uh, coming back to Francis, sir, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, building new systems uh, and, uh, you know, especially uh, in, the, uh, in the aviation world, um, both uh, satellite as well as infrastructure communication is, is, is vital, right? And now you have a ton of data. Um, how do you see, um, and then what would be your advice to the broader world in the, in the transportation who are moving to more and more autonomy um, to secure themselves? And for, for who, who do you think uh, are the, who do you think are the stakeholders that need to get involved here? I mean, beyond an organization. Yeah, certainly. That's an excellent question. Um, so the the first one is, as, we, as I mentioned, is the standards organizations. We want to have some sort of standard mm -hmm. level of cybersecurity that is uh, expected of autonomous vehicles, of expected, uh, and we have to protect all the pieces in the chain. We can't just do some of them better and not others. You know, the, the entire part of it have to be protected. So the firmware, the hardware, the software, the communications, the networks, all have to individually be protected. Um, certainly, connectivity. Uh, so, so yeah, you know, those are kind of my my advice. Is that it's not just one piece; it's all the pieces. It's not just one thing; it's all things. Uh, um, and uh, and it just has to be part of, of. I'm fond of saying it's part of the air we breathe and the water the the water we swim in. You know, the air we fly through. Uh, cybersecurity is is one of the two bases of of uh, our operation. Uh, the other one being, as I mentioned, GPS. Uh, uh, you know, we literally put that at the very bottom of the foundation and say, "What are we building on? We're building on cybersecurity as the first piece, and GP uh, resiliency for GPS. Loss of GPS is our second piece, and then everything else builds on top of it." Oh, that's a nice visualization of that. I can I can literally mm -hmm. see that happen, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and from the top and bottom as well. So great, uh, thank you, Francis. And as we wrap up, we got a couple of minutes. So, Jim, sir, um, your thoughts on on some of the closing ideas that you want to leave this uh, group with? Um, a couple things I'd like to say. One thing I, that I think has been helpful over the past year is people understand, let's not bring people into their offices. You notice I'm doing this sitting with the, the rest area of my office behind me. It was amazing how many people's <laughs> whiteboards and businesses I would see early on during this pandemic where people just wouldn't bring you back. So that part was wonderful. And I think it's really helped open people's eyes to, to risk. The thing that I would ask everybody who's a professional in cybersecurity to do is find us something that is better than passwords. Uh, trying to remember 15, 16 different passwords, having to change them every couple of weeks, it, it's just a complete breakdown. I think our IT team spends about half their week just updating people's passwords and reminding them. But if you can figure out something better than a password that will provide security, my guess is the business community is going to be the path to your door. Hey, uh, Val, we do have some questions in the comments from. Uh, yeah, I just uh, pulled up the comment section and our mm -hmm. friend Guri here has a great question. I think it will probably be a great panel topic for the next time, Guri. So is cryptocurrency the bane of cybersecurity? Uh, you know, it, it could cut both ways, right? We saw that very recently. Uh, and then it looks like our time, uh, looks like our time is up, but uh, 
uh, I, I would not uh, miss uh, uh, thanking this panel with, for this great insights. I think this was a pretty interesting and diverse uh, uh, set of thoughts uh, at every level and uh, all stakeholders probably involved in the organization are represented here. Uh, hopefully we can keep this uh, discussion going and alive and take uh, some of the takeaways from this would be implemented uh, uh, through our own organizations and our work. But uh, great to see you all. Thank you for joining this uh, uh, joining this uh, session on, on the Horasis Global Meeting uh, and encouraging a greater cybersecurity. You have a great uh, rest of the day, and I'm sure we'll stay connected and we'll keep on this uh, great mission forward. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. So much. Thank you, everybody.